good start, amen? amen? Are we going to be going into the book of Matthew this morning? We're going to get down to it. Because I believe that this is where God has a church at and has us as individuals in a place of where he's going to begin to use you in his ways and not in our way, our ways. Because our ways are the easy ways, right? Our ways are the less complicated ways. Our ways are more simplified. We make it more simple uh, according to the way that, uh, that fits us with our lifestyles. But when God's calling us out, he's going to call us out according to his will and his purpose. And so therefore, it's not always a smooth transition, but yet when we face the challenges in life, we know and we could always expect God that. So this morning, we're going to be going to the book of Matthew, starting at chapter 10. Father, we just thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives. I pray, Father, speak clarity and understanding of your word this morning. I pray, Father, that your word just goes out, Lord, and there's understanding, there's direction. God, there's, uh, there's a direction, Lord, for us. And help us, Lord, to acknowledge it, Father, and to do it wholeheartedly, knowing, God, that you're with us, Lord. We just thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing in our lives and our families and our jobs and, our, and all our situations, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 10. The twelve apostles. Going on verse 1, it says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Look, if God is calling you out this morning, and he's saying you're going to do a specific work for him, and it seems impossible, well, praise God, that means you're going to have to be going off of faith. Amen? That means you're not going off no skill set. You're not going off of something that comes automatically to you. You're not doing it because you have the experience in it. Because when God's taking us a new place, a new direction, that means we're going to have to go by faith and do it. And do it, and just do it trusting God that he's going to move in that circumstance. If God is challenging you to pray for someone in your places of healing, and God is telling you to pray for someone so that they can get healed, and yet there's doubt. We have to be able to learn to pass that doubt and pray for that person that's sick. Now, if you have a talent to be able to be hospitable to people as they come into uh, your household or to the, the church or anywhere else that it may be, and you're there, don't hold back on that gift. Be hospitable to that person. Why? Because you're the one with that gift. Whatever you have this morning, God has given it to you for a really, really specific reason. It was a great outreach yesterday we had an event to see the kids and the families that came out it was very very awesome it was nice to see the kids running around the the park with the crowds that they were given through the whole through the whole uh, the course that they were taking as far as learning as far as uh, David and Goliath later on it was pointed out to me like man look the kids that were over here like maybe at the beginning they were still running around with the crowns in the playground with their parents. Why? Because it meant something to them. They took it, they wore it because that was an experience that they had and they were able to learn something that day. See, but it's up to us on how far we're going to let ourselves experience the work of God. The more that we do, the more that we're going to experience God in our lives. The less that we do, the less that we're going to experience God in our lives. It's a proven fact. Why? Because faith is work. Faith means you have to believe. Faith means you have to go against all odds and trust God and believe God. Because I guarantee you when your faith has been proven and God comes in and begins to do something in your life and you know it's nothing but God, man, isn't that the best feeling that you ever can, can ever have in your life? It's like having your dream job and it happens and it takes place and you're like, oh my goodness, I never thought this could ever happen. God made it happen. I never thought I could get to a spiritual level because I thought I was only going to be stuck in one place because God can make it happen. I never thought I would be able to speak in front of people, teach people, be an inspiration to people, pray over people, be something for people. 
But yet, yesterday, each and every person experienced that that day, and yet God was able to bless them. Why? Because he was showing them that no matter where you go, no matter how the weather, no matter what's going on in this world, that he's going to go wherever he pleases, and he's going to have his way no matter what. And this brings inspiration not only to our hearts, but to the people that we surround ourselves with. There were people in the park wondering what was going on, eyeballing everything that's going on. One person was in the park saying, you know, when is it going to start? Can we go now? Go on ahead. People are curious. They're desiring something new. They're tired of this world. They're tired of all the news. They're tired of all the, if you don't do this and if you don't do that. But we have something free to give. We have something free to offer, and that's Jesus. Now, Jesus is the one that gives the, the salvation, but we are the ones that carry the word, that are able to deliver to people. Who I can reach, no one else can reach, but who you can reach, no one else can reach. We all have a little bit of hood in us. There's a lot of hood out there. Not everyone can reach the hood. You got a lot of people that are high class, not, I, not everyone could reach the high class. They look at me and they'll probably be like, oh, he's not high class enough for me, but there's someone else out there that's able to reach him, that they will listen to. Be inspired because God wants to use you. He sent out the 12 because the 12 were willing to listen to him and be discipled by him. Now when it had to be done and the work needed to be done, now God, now Jesus was calling him forth. And he was given the power to be able to do these things. And today, this is what Jesus, this is what God is doing with us today. He's calling us all out. He's saying, be ready. I've equipped you. I've given you what you need. Now I'm going to send you out. And when I send you out, these are the things that you should be expecting. Not to be fearful of it, but to know when it does take place, know that I'm there with you. Know that I've been there. Know that I've, ex that I've experienced this, but I'm saying this ahead of time, so when you get there, you're well prepared, and you'll continue to do what I've asked you to do. Going on, it says, now the names of the 12, it talks about all the 12 disciples and the names of them, but just as in Acts, let me turn to Acts, chapter 4, verse 33, it goes on to say, let me see if I can find it here real quick. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Great grace was upon them all. Why? Because it's God's work. When you're doing God's work, there's many things that can happen in our lives, all right? There's many things that can take place in our lives. But we have that certain grace that's on us that allows us to push on and do God's will. Have you ever felt, have you ever experienced being so stressed out on life? So stressed out on your job? Stressed out on what people may be saying and whatnot? Way before? And to experience it now, how that stress is gonna fall on you so much, how the how the how what people think about you doesn't weigh on you as heavy as it used to. Why? Because God's grace is on you. Why? Because God is showing you that I'm taking care of you in the process because you're doing my will. See, God takes care of us that way because sometimes we can feel the frustrations, we can feel the heaviness, we can feel all these things, but yet we wonder where they're coming from. What is this that I'm feeling? It's because we're not being allowed to be overtaken by the world's issues, the world's problems, the world's worries. Therefore, God brings in that peace, shows us what we're dealing with, but at the same time, he's showing us that, hey, I'm here with you. This is what you're going through, but I'm helping you through the process. And this is where God's grace comes in. See, the apostles with the influence of Christ gave great witness to others, and they had grace with them. God will equip those to carry out his will, and wherever we fall short, when we fall short, when we think we're going to fall short, he's there to help us. He's there to help us. Because I know that some of us feel like we're going to fall short. You know, God wants us to do something, and, and we're like, man, God, I'm, I'm incapable of doing this. 
why don't you ask um, brother so and so or, or sister so and so? They 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 got it more under control than I do. Why why are you calling me out to do this? And God's like, man, I, I've chosen you for this. I, I equipped you for this. I, I've given this to you. This is a gift that that I did not want to waste, and I know that you and your heart are willing to. But yet, He's asking us to get that courage, get that that strength, get that hope. See, God's given you something. It wasn't no mistake. He didn't say, any, mini, mighty, more. I'm going to give this gift to you and hope. Let's see where it goes. He didn't do that. He gave it to you because it's going to, it's a desire in your heart. But yet, we have to find it within ourselves to believe God, no matter what. And step out in faith. Faith is a big key word this morning. Faith is a big key word in our Christian entity. In our, in our walks with God. Faith is what's going to carry us. Faith is what's going to keep pushing us. And, ch- and verse 5 it says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. Why? Because the Samaritans were the ones that rejected Jesus. You can turn to, if you want to, read for later, bookmark it. It'll talk about that in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. It talks about how the Samaritans rejected Jesus. And so this is why he's speaking that. And verse 6 says, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But Jesus is saying, But speak to those that are willing to accept. Because, he dis- because the Samaritans, they're the ones that rejected Jesus. But he says, Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Why? Because those are the ones that are willing to accept. Those are the ones that were willing to change from it. Not everyone that we talk to about Jesus is going to accept it. Okay? That's, that's a fact. It took plenty of time for me to accept even hearing the name of Jesus. Let alone accepting Jesus. And let alone, even after that, allowing Jesus to work in my life. So those people that kept continuously going into my life and bugging the heck out of me, annoying the heck out of me, and just I just wanted to just hit them, I thank them today. I thank them today. Why? Because they stood their ground. They were consistent in what they were called to do. They were wanting and willing to put their lives on the line, deal with me at that time. They wanted to, they were willing to put their lives on the line no matter what. And their shame and their pride, because I'm pretty sure I said some bad things back then. And laid all down just to get another person to surrender to God. And I'm telling you this this morning because we have to be willing to lay ourselves down. We have to be willing to be humbled. To sacrifice ourselves, our, our humility. Why? Because sometimes we will be humiliated. Sometimes we will be made fun of. We will be called different names. We think we know each and every name in the book, but there's some new ones out there. Trust me. And I'm pretty sure we can be created our, our, our creative ourselves. But yet, who's that one person that is desperate for hearing the word of God, but yet no one's making time for them because they're so hard-hearted and rejecting the word of God at the same time. See, we need consistent and persistent Christian believers that are willing to go out there and keep pushing through no matter what. No matter what currents of life are coming towards them. No matter how hard life is getting. But to be pushing through and fighting the currents that are coming against us. To have that zeal and that fire within their hearts and believe in in God with all that they have. Going on verse 7, it says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons freely. You have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor copper and your money belts nor bag your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Trusting in God to meet the needs. Going from place to place, this is what they were instructed to do. 
because they're, they're going to do it by faith. No matter where they went, they're going to work for what they deserved, but yet they're going to get treated for that. Saying, go out in faith, because if, if God told you today, leave everything you have behind, your, your house, your possessions, and move over to this third world country and go to preach to them about Jesus, would you do it right away? Would you do it at all? Those are the things that they had to face. Jesus was right there telling them, don't take nothing with you, but go and speak to them. Work for what you deserve. Work for your food. Labor for your food. Basically, don't be a burden to others. He says, do this, and you will be taking care of it through it. Because as the disciples were doing this, and the message that they were speaking and that was taking place, was needing to be from God, and they needed to believe it. So when they were going and they were performing these miracles, they were speaking from God, for God, and bringing out whatever God wanted to do, and through these miracles that they were doing, people were starting to believe it. They were starting to see it. So it's through their work, through their faith, and their testimony, that people were able to see that Jesus was real, that God was real. And it's through the fruit of our labor, the ministry's label, labor, our individual labor, as we're going out there and we're working and we're talking to people and we're witnessing to people and they're seeing things change in our lives, they're seeing things change in their lives because they're asking for prayer, they're needing prayer. And all of a sudden, God's becoming more evident in their lives. Guess what's going to take place? They're going to come right back to you. It may not be the time and the place that we want, but it's going to be a time and a place where it's right, where it's ready for them to receive, when they're ready to take in and experience the true power of God. But yet, we won't experience this if we don't stay consistent in it. Consistency is the key because it's so easy to say, I've done something, now I can relax and take a break. Because when God says, keep going, we got to keep going, we got to keep the momentum going, that's when it gets hard. That's when it gets tiring. That's when it gets like, well, there's been a lot going on, yes, and God's doing it all. God's doing it all. We're just there to help with the labor. We're there to plant the seeds of the good word, but God's doing everything else. But he's looking for those that are faithful. Verse 9 says, Provide neither gold nor silver, nor copper in your money belt, nor bag your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for workers worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is, who is in it is worthy. And stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And the peace that it's talking about means the good or blessing which you have in Christ to share. Meaning if you're welcome to a household, share what you have. Give what you have. Because that means if you're accepted, everything that you say and bring is also going to be accepted as well. So bring in your peace. Bring in the word of God which brings in peace and understanding. And bring this sin. But to those that reject, those that want nothing to do with you, they will not receive. They will not take in. And so this is what it's saying. Take your peace back with you. And it says to share Christ through salutation and benediction. Meaning to give what you have. Everything that you have. Have you ever been at a job site and you're like the big guy. Let's say you're a big guy. Or you know a lot more than the newbie, right? The newbie comes around, the newbie comes around. Well, how do you do this? And how do you do that? How do you do this? And you're like, you show very minimum. You show very minimum, so therefore that newbie can do very minimum. But they keep asking you questions because they want to grow. They want to know more about the job so that they can succeed 
But yet in our minds, we're like, well, I don't want you to fully succeed because I don't want you to pass me up. Have you ever been in that situation before? Because this person's more on fire, this person's more aggressive, this person is more lively, and I'm still here stuck in this place. But they're asking all these questions. They want to grow. They want to continue to, to experience new things. And I'm just sitting here like, man, I don't want them to pass me up. So I'm only going to give them so much, so little. Have you ever experienced that before? See, we, can, we have to be careful when we're talking to people or speaking to people that we're giving them the fullness, that we're giving them everything. Why? Because if we're not going to have courage to do it, they're going to have the courage to do it. If we're too scared to speak in front of people, they're going to be the ones to speak up for you. See, we're here to uplift each other. We're up here to encourage each other. But as we know this in the ministry, in the churches today, we have to take this out and take it out there outside the walls. And those that are wanting to learn, those that are wanting to receive and give freely. Don't be like this guy that's down the street that says, I'll prophesy to you for $100 an hour. Wow. Well, those of you that know where we're, at, we're located at, please don't drive down there and go get your prophecy. Prophecy, yeah, you don't need to pay for that. You're just prostituting the word of God. But it was an advertisement that I seen a, a, a prophet. I'm gonna, you have to pay $200. $300, depending on how long you want to meet with them to get a word, that's ridiculous. Here's your free advice right here. Amen. Amen. Your free advice, free of charge. You don't have to pay for it because Jesus already paid the price. Amen. All you have to do is ask for wisdom, ask for discernment, ask for understanding. God will give it to you. Trust me, I bear witness to that. I couldn't understand doo-doo. I couldn't understand nothing. And I always prayed, and I got fresh, and I'd be like, Lord, help me to understand. Help me to remember scripture. I want to be one of those guys that quote scripture when I'm out, out in the street. And he's like, I didn't make you to be that way. Man, Lord, then what do you want me to be? You're called. I don't want to be called. I want to be one of those guys, those evangelists that go on the street in the corner, knowing scripture in the back of my head. No. Why? Because you're called. I don't want to be called. I want to be an usher. I want to do this. I want, I want to be the background guy. But God's going to use you no matter what. Maybe you won't be able to remember scripture. Maybe you will be able to remember scripture. Maybe you won't be able to do certain things, but you will be able to be great on doing other things. And whatever God's giving you, that talent, that gifting, excel in it. Grow in it. Because that doesn't mean that God's going to stop there. Maybe he's just waiting for you to finish that one gift that he's given so that you can give, pass on the other gift that you're ready to receive. Because sometimes, no, let's, let's, let's not say sometimes, because all the time before we can receive something new, we have to allow God to mature us so that we can understand the way that God works so that when God begins to do the work, we're mature enough in our Christian faith to say, you know what, God, to you the glory. Because I'm just a messenger. I'm just one that's just foolish enough to go out there and do whatever you want me to do. But God, you did it all. And thank you, Lord, because I know without you, I cannot do anything. And this is why God brings us in spurts and levels. He raises the bar. Have you ever experienced God speaking to you. You pray for something. God's doing something. And then all of a sudden, you're right there. Man, man, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'm right there. I'm right where I wanted to be. Man, but I love this. I, I desired this. Man, God, you're good. And all of a sudden, you, you, you don't see it, but it's spiritual because you, now you're maturing. Now you're understanding this bar is going like this. And like, whoa, whoa. hey, what, what's going on? I'm starting to have to grow more. What? This, I wanted this. But God's like, since you understand this, I'm going to raise you up to a greater level. So once you begin to understand who you are, then God's going to continue to raise you up to a different level. Verse 14, it goes on to say, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, 
When you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. As surely I say to you, I will be I will be more tolerable for the lands of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Man, I do not want to live there. Trust me. I do not want to be a part of that. When you go and do the work of God, no matter where you go, when you're testifying, when you're preaching, when you're sharing scripture, and people do not want to listen to you, they reject Jesus. They're rejecting Christ, not you. Not you. You're the messenger. You're bringing the news. They're rejecting Christ, not you. But if you were to talk like them, guess what? Oh, come on in. Let's hang out. Let's watch some football. Let's watch some soccer. Let's watch something on the, on the YouTube. Let's hang out. Let's chill. But you talk about Jesus. Nah, bro, I don't, I don't have time for that. And they shut the door on you. Or they, they depart from you and act like they never knew you. John 1, 11 says, He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. His own people did not receive Him. His own people couldn't even recognize Him. How is that? How is that? Because they were blind. They were able to see. When we go outreaching, when we're doing a work, when we're doing events, when God is doing something and having doors shut on our face, don't let it discourage you. Keep pushing through because somebody needs to hear the word of God. There was a lady the other day and she called while the event was taking place. And she said, this flyer was left on my door. <coughs> is it still going on? Is it still happening? I'm like, yeah, it is. Come on by. And she came by, great conversation. And we're talking for, for quite some time, good conversation. And come to find out, she's not even older than me, and we grew up in the same neighborhood. And we're like, man, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? I, I got to see pictures, because there's a lot of people by names. But it's so crazy on how you can grow up close to one another in the same neighborhood and not yet know each other. But yet they go to a church that was close by. And what I say is because no one answered and that flower was left there by somebody, God still drew them in. God still drew them in. I've gotten phone calls before. I think I, I don't think I shared it before, but I shared it with a few. But I got phone calls before. Oh, we were we were outreaching in a certain neighborhood. And I got a me. I think I erased it. I might have it still, but I'm not going to play it. It was pretty bad. You guys need to take your Jesus and go to a different neighborhood. Don't be knocking on my door. I don't want to hear nothing about this and a couple more choice words and whatnot. It's like, man, okay, well, I guess he, they, they don't want Jesus then. That's fine. There's plenty more that are out there. We, I get the phone calls. It does happen. It takes place. You will receive it. But it's how you react from it. How are you going to take it and go on with it? It's not going to kill you. It's not going to destroy you. It might bring you down, but let Jesus bring you back up. Verse 16 says, Behold, I sent... I like this verse right here. Because this verse we'd like to hear, right? Because we're sheep, right? Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be as wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. But wherever men, but wherever, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and scourge you in the synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So what it's saying right here is stay spiritually awake and let God show you what may lies ahead. We have to be ready to receive what's going on. I'm going to read it one more time just in case it says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Beware, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. 
You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. This is why it is very important that we stay spiritually awake. Spiritually, not physically, not looking and seeing, okay, what am I looking for? I'm looking for something specific. No, spiritually awake. Why? Because when we're spiritually awake, God may show us what lies ahead. God may show us the traps, the snares that the enemy has set before us that can possibly bring a stumble to us, trip us, and make us fall. Have you ever had that, that conviction in your heart? Or that conviction like, I shouldn't be in this place. Or I shouldn't be doing this. And you felt bad, but yet you ignore that. And you do it anyway. See, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The more that we listen to that conviction, the more peace we will be within our lives. The more that we ignore that, the more headaches and frustration and everything in life you will experience. Why? Because you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and to speak to you and to deliver you from the hands of the enemy for making these bad choices in life. So this is why we have to stay spiritually awakened so that God can speak to us and show us what may be lying ahead. So when we do face persecution, our actions reflect Christ. When we face persecutions, our reactions, they reflect Christ. Because sometimes when we face something and something's coming against us, or our families, especially our families, we want to react differently, right? We want to, we want to, we don't always be the Christians that we're supposed to be, but we strive to be that Christian. We all fall short, okay? We all fall short. But as soon as we recognize this, it's important for us to step back and say, you know what? This isn't for me to handle. This is for God to handle. Because the moment you recognize that and the moment you realize that, it's going to save you from a lot of headache. Why? Because when you go into your frustration and you go into your anger, that means you're going to react exactly on what you're feeling. And you're going to make some pretty bad choices. You're going to make some bad choices that you're going to regret that night. You're going to wake up the next morning and you're going to ask yourself, why did I make this decision? Why did I have to say this to that particular person? I love them. I cared for them. But yet, I bit my tongue. I stuck my shoe in my mouth. I did all of the above. And now I'm paying the price today. How come I just didn't listen to God and just be quiet and allow him just to speak to me, even though it was going against all my flesh, all my thoughts, and all my feelings, but yet, in, at, in the end process, it saved me from a lot of heartache. This is what the Spirit of God will do for you. Save you from headaches. Save you from headaches. It works in marriages, too. All it does, it, it works in marriages. I'm not downplaying marriages this morning. I'm just saying it works in marriages. When your wife has God and your husband has God and God is in the middle, it works wonders in your marriage. Why? Because you're not trying to gain the upper hand by whatever wisdom you think you have. Because when we get in arguments, not that we ever do, right? But I'm just saying if we ever get in arguments, I'm more right than you are. No, 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 no. You think you're right, but I'm right right here. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it doesn't stop because it's a great debate in the household. And the kids are just sitting there like, I don't want to go there. Or now they're just talking again, and they go back into the other room, whatever. But because God is intertwined in the middle of that marriage, there's more peace in that marriage. Not total peace. There's more peace in that marriage. And when you fight, and when you get upset, whatever the case may be, Five minutes later, you're going back and you're just like, you know what, <coughs> what's for dinner? Or what are we doing tomorrow? Or let's go out and eat. And you forget all about it. This is why it's important that we keep God in the midst of everything. Luke 21, chapter 12 through 13. Chapter 21, verses 12 through 13. It says, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. 
but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. So basically, when you get delivered, when people are bringing you out, God's going to give you opportunity to be a witness. He's going to give you opportunity to speak. Don't be worried about what you're going to say or what you're going to do. Because God's going to give you exactly what needs to be done. We have to stay faithful and use the opportunity for testimony. Because action speaks louder than words. Action speaks louder than words. We could say anything and everything about ourselves that is great, that is mighty, that is out there spectacular. But when it comes down to it, how's your personal relationship with God? How do you live today? Who do you listen to? What do you listen to? How's your talk? How's your actions? How's your thought process? When you're told to do something, what's your reaction to it? See, we could say that we're a good person, but in actuality, is our actions, is our testimony actually showing that? Because that means it's going to go on 24-7. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Verse 20 says, Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and child will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in the city, flee to another, for surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Death, particularly to kill and put to death. Look at this, remember, hear this scripture right here, verse 21 says, Now brother will deliver brother up to death, up brother to death, and a father his child, and children, teenagers and below, and teenagers and above, children, will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Why? Because teenagers, guess what? Sometimes you want your mom and dad to be quiet. Don't lie. You in church. Sometimes. You you in, in the back of your head, you're saying something that you know if you heard, you get the you get the whip on you, right? You don't have to say yes or no. Look towards the wall if you need to. There's something in the back of your head when your parents tell you to do something, you don't and you disagree with it. You're you're saying something Verbally, like, oh my gosh, why don't you just leave me alone? In the back of your head, you're like, man, you're saying some pretty nasty stuff. <laughs> and you're like, you're saying, oh, man, I wish you would leave me alone and go somewhere else. But in reality, reality, it's taking a lot more today. Have you heard about the news? Have you heard the news? Everything that's going on with families and children and, and, and everything that's taking place. They're following someone else's opinion. This one man followed someone else's opinion and said that this guy, I don't like mentioning too many names, but he was convinced by this speaker saying that his children were going to become monsters one day. So guess what he did to his children? That's it. They're no longer here. He took care of them. Brother against brother. Family against family. We have family that do not want to be around us, that hate us, we have family that is actually doing this today and just not caring about the end results. It's true and it's happening. The world and their heart has grown colder and colder and colder. It's so easy to speak freely. It's so easy to act freely. It's so easy to call, to cause a ruckus. It's easy. It's so easy. I could easily throw this mic down on the ground, go to all the empty chairs and toss them around, and create a ruckus, cause disruption, cause chaos. One person can do all this. But it's a choice that we make today. It's one person's choice, one person's action. And we have to know that each and every one of us here are that much accountable to our choice and our action. 
See, sometimes we think in our minds, well, this, this is not much. I'm not going to be able to do it. I can't do it, but I don't want to. Your choice. But there's going to be action that follows that. There will be repercussions that goes along with that decision that you made. See, when God is challenging you to do something, and you're telling God, you know what, God? I don't know about this. I'm not ready for this now. But God's doing this. He, he's putting it on your heart. Yeah, man, Lord, I, I, I want to, but I just don't know. He knows that you don't know how. He, he, he knows that. He knows that you, you truly don't understand it. He knows that. Trust me. He knows everything. But your decision in that creates a ripple effect for everyone else that's supposed to be getting that touch specifically from you. It causes a ripple effect. And if that one person doesn't miss it, but the next one and the next one and the next one, why? Because from that one, you're supposed to learn something and grow from it. The next one, you're supposed to learn more and grow from it, and it continues to go and go and go. Now, the longer we wait for this one person, the longer we wait to step in for this one thing, all these others are just waiting longer and longer and longer. And God forbid if we were not able to reach them when we were supposed to. This is why it is important that if God has been tugging on your heart, go with what God was saying. Trust me, you have peace at night. Trust me, when you do it, you experience a new level of experience with God. And you want to tell people about it, but heck, you don't even know how to explain it. You ever, you ever have that? You're like, man, God's so good. Well, what did he do? He's done a lot. Well, what did he do? I, quit asking me, bro. I don't know how to explain it, but he's doing a lot. It's like when you have your first boyfriend, your first girlfriend. You, no one else sees nothing in them, but you see something in them. You love them for some reason. Or sometimes maybe you don't see something at that point in time. And people are asking questions, well, why do you even love him? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I like this love feeling. No, but specifically, why do you love them? I, I, I don't know. I love the thought of being in love. There has to be a reason that you love something. There has to be a reason. you got to see God in this so that God can define this for you. Because love without a meaning is an empty meaning. You could say you love someone, but if you don't know how to love them or the reason for loving them, then all it is is just a feeling and an emotion. But see, when God shows you the love that you have for someone, and now you're understanding, okay, I love them for this and this because they're good for me in this. They're good for me in that. They're an inspiration. They're needing God. I'm here for a specific reason. Guess what? Now you're loving them differently. Because our love hurts. Their love hurts. But when they learn to love and God's love and you learn to love and God's love, then that love makes sense. Tina Turner, sing it best. What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Woo, yeah. All, all of this is just emotions. God's love will show you true love. And once you know true love, then you know what kind of love that you should be receiving, what kind of love is, is expected. See, because sometimes we get into this love where we think that this is love. This is, this is my love. This is what I'm able to receive. This is my understanding of love. And once you have a low standard of what love is, then you're just going to accept that for the rest of your lives. Because you only have a certain understanding of what love is. But when you understand God's love, then you're going to know God's love. And so what people have to give you, it's not going to be like, oh, this isn't love. This is love. This is God's love. And he's given me his love. So this is the type of love that I should be receiving. And in this, you raise yourself and God raises you to a higher standard. This is the type of love that you deserve. This is the type of love that you should be receiving. And if you are not receiving this type of love, 
then this isn't true love. My love is true love. My love overcomes. My love covers a multitude. Because love is an emotion. And we all have an emotion. We all have emotions, amen? When it gets hot, are we all smiling? No, we're not. See? <laughs> She's revealing the truth. She's like, no. We cry. We get angry. We get anxious. Love. Ask God today. That's your challenge. Ask God today. What is true love? Show me what true love is. What verse was I at? 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house of his bells above, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is no nothing covered that will be revealed and hidden that will come to be known, not to be known. So basically, how they seen Jesus and how he was delivering those from sicknesses, demon possession or whatnot, and how the Pharisees was, were saying, oh, he works for the devil, or he, you know, he's casting out his own kind demons, this and that, and this is what he was saying. How much more those that were under him, that were following him, how much more would they be ridiculed? Will they be called out? and be called the same thing. Why? Because they were living out Jesus Christ. They were living out his teachings. They were under him. So therefore, they were teaching his teachings. Luke, 4, Luke chapter 6, verse 40 says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Some of us are called to do a lot of things. Some of us are called to preach. Some of us are called to teach. Some of us are called to be worship leaders. Now you have leaders that are put ahead of you. You will never be greater than them. Okay, let's put that out there. You will never be greater than them because God appointed them specifically so that you can grow. Now as you're under them, they will teach you everything. Everything that they know because that's the responsibility. And wherever you take from that, you're going to grow your own. You're going to excel in your own way. But it's not to turn back and say, I don't need you no more. I've outgrown you. And so therefore, I'm going to leave you alone and go do my own thing. We have to be careful when we're learning something. When you're being discipled, you're not going to be greater than the teacher. This is God's word because that person that's discipling you has been appointed and anointed. You will be like that teacher, but you will never not be over. You know, you will not be over that person. Now you will grow into your own person and you will do your own work. And therefore, when you take disciples of your own, guess what? They will not be greater than you if God has appointed you. That doesn't mean go and do your own work because you're setting yourself up for failure. That means people will come in and they will surpass you because it wasn't your calling to do so. Verse 25, when it goes to say, it is not enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more would they call those of his household? See, if the Pharisees in those days, the religious leaders, seen Jesus in a certain type of light as they did today, imagine how many people will also look at us. They're not called Pharisees, they're just called unbelievers. We just changed the names. They're called unbelievers. Jesus was always accused of blasphemy. When we preach the word of God, when we tell people about Jesus, the first thing they do is, are you vaccinated? Do you believe in mass? I believe in Jesus, bro. I'm talking, about, talking to you about the Lord, not about the concerns of the world. 
I'm talking about you, about Jesus, what can save them. But they want to listen to what's going on today. That's the immediate fix. Verse 27 says, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls into the ground apart from your father's will? The very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valued than many sparrows. You're more valuable than anything. I've always, I'm closing right there. I've always liked that scripture, you know, God knows the numbers on our hair. It's kind of like, I always wonder, like, well, what if I go bald? Did he know that? God already knows I'm going to go bald before him. But as a kid, you know, you, you think these crazy things, you know, like, how can he know the, how can, how can, how's that possible? Did he know I was going to get stitches on my head and lose some hair too? But God knows all. God knows our future. So of course he's seen that. If he was to show us, hey, yeah, you're going to lose some hair as you get this old, guess what? We're going to go try to look for a fix for it. We're going to go get some real game, okay? We're going to go get something to replace that hair that he said that we're going to lose. So we're going to come up with a backup plan so that doesn't happen. See, when God is speaking to us in parts of our lives and he's given us so much, he's telling us so much that we can be ready for it. Because God knows with us and the way that we think, if he was to tell us too much a little bit more ahead, guess what? Well, if I do this, it's going to take me that way. So I want to avoid this headache that God showed me, and I'm going to go this route instead because it's going to deter me from going that direction. We're going to do exactly that. Exactly that. Why do you, why do you think most of us use MapQuest when we go out of town? Because if there's an accident ahead, we want to go a different route. If there's something else going on ahead and this way shorter, guess what? Change directions. Why? Because it's more convenient. Less hassle. It may take a little bit more time, but I'll still get there. Having to go through a different course of action. When God's given us direction, it's important for us to take that course of direction that he's given us. Why? Because there's something that you're praying for today. There's something that you've been praying for that you want to sincerely take place in your life. And he's given you direction. And he's given you a place to go. But if we avoid going that direction, then that promise has been pushed back even much more further. Because that promise is going to be, be ready to be given to us when we're ready to receive it. To be thankful for it. So be encouraged this morning. Listen to God's word. Listen to his direction. Listen to his promises. If God promised you something, he's going to give it to you. That's his promise, not mine. God will give it to you. He's done it to mine. And just challenge him. Lord, I seek this. Help me to understand this. Help me to understand that. And he'll give it to you. And he'll bring you that knowledge and he'll bring you that understanding. Amen. Father, we just thank